Uh, so this is going to be a discussion about uh, how we get some sort of pressure feedback or uh, contention feedback from uh, LRU ma maps in the GPS subsystem. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the uh, background that inspired this talk, a um, particular incident that we had. Um, I'll do a bit of a deep dive on how the LRU actually works in the uh, uh, BPF subsystem, since um, at least if you're like me before I did this talk, then you knew what an LRU is, but you didn't know how it actually uh, worked in practice. Uh, and then hopefully that's useful for a basis for some discussion about uh, whether there are things we can do to emit um, some sort of signal about the uh, uh, about contention on the LRU map, uh, or, or maybe something more radical like don't use it. Um, but I guess that's up to the discussion. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, so it, it all starts with this uh, incident. So uh, user uh, reported that they were seeing packets getting dropped after a production upgrade. Um, so a couple of things that we noticed uh, investigating this environment was that uh, for one thing, we were seeing policy drops where the destination uh, of those uh, uh, of those events was uh, the ephemeral port range. Uh, so in Cilium, we define the network policy or firewall and rules uh, based on uh, typically two ports and also two some some containers, some endpoints based on labels, uh, and then we will allow the reply direction traffic uh, via uh, the connection tracker. Um, so typically, if uh, a packet is towards the ephemeral port range, that's kind of an, it's an indication that perhaps it's a reply direction traffic. Uh, and so we shouldn't really be seeing a, a drop due to policy denied uh, in this direction. Uh, the other thing we noticed was we got this uh, CT map insertion failure uh, metric incremented. Uh, so this will, Cilium will do this when, whenever it attempts to insert an element into the LRU map, uh, and that insertion actually fails. So the BPF helper call returns some sort of error code that says, nope, I can't do that. Uh, which is kind of interesting when you consider that the LRU property is supposed to evict some old entry uh, when you uh, insert something into the map and, and uh, there's not enough space. Uh, but evidently, there are error conditions which it, it simply can't handle. Um, so at the time, we didn't have any metrics on how many flows were actually counting, uh, running through the system at, at that point in time. So um, but we were able to kind of eyeball, and it seemed like we're getting kind of in the order of 40,000, 50,000 entries changing uh, in this map within an order of sort of seconds. Uh, so on a map that at the time that was sized at about 250,000 entries, we're talking about a relatively high churn on that, uh, on that map. Uh, so a little bit about how Cilium's using uh, LRU here. So we use uh, the LRU hash map for firewalling purposes. For NAT, we have a few different tables. Uh, so both for these two, and then we also split with uh, UDP and TCP. Uh, so some of the properties we'd like, well, it's a hash table, and, and that's what we were using before we used a, a LRU map. Uh, but one of the motivations for using an LRU map is uh, garbage collection as you go. So rather than uh, starting to drop traffic as soon as you hit uh, the size of the, of the table and then having to have to run an out-of-band uh, garbage collection uh, step to, to clean up entries and then allow new connections to flow through, um, this allows us to sort of garbage collect as we're um, adding additional entries. Um, so some of the difficulties we've had, so actually understanding what the current contention rate is. Um, and so I guess that's kind of the, the point of this talk. Um, LRU also, like, although it's kind of related to the way that timers work, so each of the entries in the CT map um, uh, from Cilium will have a specific timer, uh, perhaps based on um, the TCP state or so on. Uh, so it's, it's not a direct relationship between the LRU property and when these timers actually expire. So it's a, a little odd. But, um, and then we also have a connection tracking map and NAT map. And so when we do a NAT uh, operation, uh, we'll perhaps uh, update entries in both of these maps. Uh, and they both represent the same connection. So when that connection goes away, ideally, we'd have tied fates such that when you delete an entry from one of those maps, then it would delete the entry from the other map. Um, but uh, in practice, we don't have a mechanism to do that today. Uh, so what we do is we have an out-of-band uh, user space um, garbage collection step, which then dumps the NAT table uh, and reconciles those, so deleting the entries that, that should no longer exist, when, particularly when things are evicted uh, due to the LRE property. Um, so in the end, when we uh, sort of dug into the, the particular incident, we identified that uh, during the upgrade, the 
pods which handle the ingress towards the uh, towards the cluster. So all of the various connections from outside the cluster coming into the cluster were all going through a dedicated set of uh, workload pods. And uh, there was no rules around how those were scheduled within the cluster. And so basically, they just shoved all of those pods all into the same node. And all of a sudden, you have a much higher connection rate on that particular node, even though the um, previously it was supporting that level of connection load across the entire cluster. Uh, simply by having those ingress uh, applications working on different nodes in the cluster. Um, so we ended up spreading uh, those around the, the cluster, and then we were able to lower the per node impact below this threshold where, um, at that point, the, the data path could actually handle it. And then the other mitigation is, is in terms of um, the size of that map. So you can choose what the size of that map is. And so presumably, depending on the um, amount of load that you're putting on that map, uh, you will want to size it appropriately. Um, so yeah, so I guess the question that came up was like, how, how can we make this uh, more obvious? So we did get this one strong signal from the environment, uh, which is a CT map insertion failure. Uh, when we looked at the count of these metrics, uh, like initially we weren't sure if it was directly related or not, um, because it was a relatively small number of uh, instances of this uh, uh, failure or this failure metric. Um, and that was over the period of hours. And, and yet it seemed like the impact on the actual workloads was pretty high. Um, and so it wasn't quite obvious to us whether it was kind of increasing over time, I mean, clearly linear relationship with the impact on the cluster or uh, quite what. So there's kind of a bit of concern there that uh, if that uh, metric is only triggered under very, very high contention scenarios, then it may be, uh, there may still be a situation where we're putting a lot of load on the LRU map. It is starting to affect workloads. Uh, but we are not getting this particular signal. So how could we get a signal kind of like that, mm -hmm. such that if you're starting to deploy a whole bunch of this same type of workload or uh, perhaps workloads that are very um, connection intensive all onto the same node, then ideally we have some sort of way to uh, notify either the user or perhaps like the management planes that can automatically figure out and, and either you know, alert, please take action, or maybe even automatically uh, redistribute the, uh, the load across the cluster. Um, so one idea here is like, okay, how full is the map? Um, so we could dump and count uh, the number of entries in the map from user space. That's certainly one way of doing it. Um, it seems seems a little inefficient. So it seemed like maybe we ideally would be able to just increment some counters, perhaps per CPU, uh, to keep track of how many entries are in the map at a given point in time. So every time we do an insert, we do an increment of this counter. Um, and then maybe uh, decrement the counter or have a separate counter uh, to count deletes. Um, and then between that, across all the CPUs, you can figure out how many actual, actual entries are in the map at a given point in time. Uh, so one of the problems we have with this is that in the LRU map type, uh, if you have explicit updates or deletes, then we can certainly um, count those. Uh, but if we do an update and that automatically evicts an entry from the table, um, uh, as part of the update, uh, as part of the LRU property, then we don't actually have a way to count that at the moment. The, the BPF helper API doesn't expose uh, that signal to us. So we can do an update, but we have absolutely no idea whether that actually de decremented the number of entries that are currently in the map. Um, so as soon as we've basically filled up the table, we have no idea how full the table actually is. Um, so coming from that idea, we're kind of like, okay, well, let me just write like a a rough API description, and then we'll figure out what the details are. So um, the idea was we add a new flag. When you create the map, you say, I'm interested in getting pip, uh, pressure uh, feedback on this map. Uh, and then if you opt into this, then when you actually do a map update call, uh, the helper call, then if it evicts an entry, then it somehow gives you back some signal. Maybe it says, you know, um, I deleted and I evicted an entry this time you told me to update. And then we can update our counters. Um, or, yeah, I guess if it's more detailed than that, I guess we find out in the uh, implementation. Um, so briefly, a, a little shout out to uh, Martin Lau, because the Git log for this was really, really helpful to try and dig into this and, and how it works. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, about the structure of the LRU. Uh, so we have the nodes there. They're um, affiliated with a particular CPU. They have a reference bit, which we uh, set whenever we're doing lookups or updates, at least from the BPF side. I think lookups from the user space side uh, don't trigger that. Um, then we have uh, a series of lists to maintain the LRU property, and then we have the hash map to maintain the, the hash properties. Uh, so initially what we'll have is um, a bunch of pre-allocated uh, uh, entries in the free lists. Um, 
And then over time, as we start to insert elements into the uh, LRU, then we'll take a, a node out of the free list, and then we will update the, uh, the data associated with that. Typically, we'll try to keep these updates uh, on the local CPU if we can. So we have per CPU free lists, uh, and then the uh, uh, pending lists there as well, so that uh, we don't have to flush all of those updates to the global lists uh, at a given point in time. Uh, and then uh, periodically, you would flush those to the global lists, and you have the inactive and active lists. And so the idea is that uh, as entries are used, then they'll bubble up towards the top of the active list, and then um, as they're as they become less recently used, then you'll, those entries will bubble uh, first towards the inactive list and then perhaps towards the bottom of that inactive list. Uh, and then the idea, of course, is uh, when you run out of entries to actually allocate, then you can ideally skim off the bottom of that inactive list and then take those entries, free them, uh, and then start using those um, for subsequent updates. Um, and so you have per CPU lock, and then you have global LRU lock for the LRU lists, and then uh, the hash table bucket locks for the, uh, the hash table itself. So briefly, a couple of terminology steps of, of combined pop free and rotate here. Um, effectively, this is uh, when I want to do an update and I don't have any entries in my local CPU's free list, uh, I'll try to perhaps steal some from the global uh, free list. Um, as soon as, as soon as you want to do that, you need to grab the global LRU lock, so we might as well do some housekeeping. We'll try to do, shuffle entries between the active and inactive lists um, to maintain the kind of LRU sorting properties between those lists. Uh, and at the same time, we'll flush any pending entries from the local CPU's pending list and push those into either inactive or active lists, depending on how uh, uh, where that reference bit is set on the, on the particular node. Uh, so, I, yeah, I guess I consider this kind of the yeah, house, housekeeping, kind of just keeping the LRU property um, up to date. Uh, and then if it turns out that there's no entries in the free list, uh, in the global free list, uh, then there's the shrink operation, which is where we're skimming those entries off the bottom of the, of the inactive list and, and trying to uh, basically free a bunch of entries that we can then use. Um, and typically, this will be batched as well. So it's, it's not like we're assuming that we um, pull, you know, we want to do one update, therefore we will grab the global lock and then just grab one entry and then we're, we're done. It's more like we'll grab up to, say, 128 entries out of the global lists to my own CPU so that the next 100, uh, 128 inch uh, updates from the CPU ideally won't have to go and grab that lock again. Um, so broadly, I was, with this slide, I was trying to kind of convey an idea that we're trying to uh, have the least impact as we can uh, as we try to do these updates. So if it's possible to just do this per CPU on the local CPU, then we'll do that. Um, of course, the hash table is kind of separate, so you, you'll we'll be still updating the hash table, but at least in terms of the lists. Um, ideally, you're not grabbing the global LRU lock. Uh, if you don't have free uh, nodes in your local CPU's free list, then you'll go to the uh, global, and then first try to use the free entries in the global list. And if that's not possible, um, inactive uh, entries from those global lists. Uh, if every entry or every entry within a, a bounded time uh, seems like it's referenced uh, in those global lists, uh, then we start to get into the realm of just like, hey, give me any one entry. All I'm trying to do is update the map. Uh, just give me something that I can actually make this a successful operation. Uh, and we'll even fall back to attempting to pull one, uh, an entry from any other CPU as long as there's some free element or pending element on, on another CPU as well. So to actually step through the logic, so yes, yeah, so the first step is um, we say, okay, is there an entry available in the local uh, CPU's free list? If yes, okay, great, we'll just use that entry. Uh, if we can then insert that entry into the hash table, then great, we're, uh, we're successful here. Uh, if not, then we can fail with eBusy, so that's um, at least one failure condition. You'll find that this right-hand side is, is duplicated throughout this logic, so this, this seems like the most common uh, failure uh, scenario under uh, contended uh, uh, situation. Uh, and then if this is successful, then basically we're going to add it to the local pending list uh, for the local CPU so that eventually at some point we're going to flush that to the, to the global lists. Now if this fails, well then we need to start to go to the uh, global list. So we've got the global LRU lock. Um, so we'll do our kind of housekeeping. We'll flush the pending lists to the global lists. Um, and then we'll attempt to grab 
free target, which is just a, um, a defined, I think it's 128, uh, entries from the global free list into the local free lists. So then we have a bunch of entries that we can uh, subsequently then just do uh, on the current CPU. Uh, and of course, if we actually manage to reach that target number of entries that we've pulled to the local CPU, then great. Okay, we're, we're pretty much set. We can, you know, we can again attempt to actually update the hash table and, we'll, um, uh, and then perhaps be successful. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we're not able to grab, you know, 128 entries from those from the global free list, then we need to start to do some sort of garbage collection or try to find another some number of entries. And the target would be 128, but you know, um, it's really up to the the current situation of the, of the list to, to determine how many that will actually be. So if if that fails, then we're going to do the shrink operation. So we're going to start to steal entries from the inactive list. Um, if I think the if an active list is maybe if it's empty, then we'll try to steal from the active list or something like that. So both the inactive and active lists can actually have entries that are that haven't been referenced since the last time that this operation occurred. So we can potentially steal from either of these uh, entries. Um, and at this point, we we get a little less ambitious about the number of entries we want to steal to the local uh, CPU. So it's really just like, did we manage to grab any of these entries? If there's any entries available, then our update that we're attempting to do will be a successful operation, or can be a successful operation, as long as the hash table bucket uh, lock uh, step succeeds. Um, so then we kind of consider that a, a success, and okay, we've updated the map, and we've also potentially got some number of elements that we can use um, subsequently. So if that fails, we get into this sort of desperate mode that I, I mentioned. Um, so we may start to steal an entry from the inactive list, uh, the active list. We start to ignore whether the bit was even, like the reference bit was even set or not. Um, and then, so we just try to grab any one entry, remove it from the hash table. If we're able to remove it from the hash table, then okay, we've, we've removed sort of a recently referenced uh, entry, but you know, we're able to actually successfully uh, do our update. Uh, at that point, if the hash table uh, lock, uh, uh, bucket lock, grab fails, then we go into this iterating through all the CPUs. Starting from the current CPU, try to use the uh, the pending, the, sorry, the free list if there is free entries on uh, a CPU. Uh, if that's not available, then try to grab uh, some not so re recently referenced uh, entry in a pending uh, list from the CPU. Uh, and failing that, um, just steal basically any entry you can get your hands on. Um, so there is an enomem failure case here as well, and then the regular um, sort of path um, so in, in the particular scenario where uh, uh, I was reporting from the beginning of the talk, I don't actually know which of these two cases occurred, whether it was the eNoMem or the eBusy case. I wasn't actually exposing that particular error code at the time. Uh, my guess would be eBusy because it just seems like uh, by the time we've followed this entire kind of left-hand side path, like we're getting pretty desperate and we're going through all sorts of different, um, like the amount of actual contention seems like it's very, very high to trigger that. Um, it's kind of hard to hard to know. We, we can only speculate at this point. So um, this is kind of the leading the discussion section. So on the right hand side here, I've got the overall flow uh, that I've just presented to you of the um, uh, of the update uh, mechanisms. So towards the top, we have sort of the un, uh, ideal range where there's enough free entries available, and you can just kind of pick one. And if you can't pick one in the local CPU, that's fine. We'll go to the global list. And we'll, we'll pick one there. Um, below that, you sort of kind of get into the sort of GC range where we start to have to do some housekeeping. Um, we need to shuffle, you know, rotate entries, uh, perhaps try to shrink the um, the entries. We start to steal entries from the uh, inactive lists or active lists. Um, and then below that, you kind of start to pa panic and just say, get, get me anything I can get my hands on. Um, and then at the final end, it's it's really, if, if you weren't able to uh, find any entry within a, a, a bounded uh, number of iterations. So I think that's also down to about 128. So if you've iterated through, you've tried to find any entry, you can kind of lock the hash table bucket and remove from the, the global hash table. If that fails, then we kind of get into this steal from other CPUs uh, kind of case. So I have some ideas that I'm going to just like throw out here. Um, OK, so first, we are actually monitoring this uh, last step. That's If the actual update fails, then we're, we're monitoring this. We're emitting, emitting events. Um, but of course, the concern we have is that that's that's not giving us a, a good enough signal. 
uh, perhaps the, the frequency of those is, is not quite high enough. Um, so one idea would be we just count every implicit delete. So whenever we do actually flush entries out of the, uh, the global lists, um, so this is part of the shrink operation, uh, then perhaps we'd return back the number of entries that we evicted from that, uh, that global list. Since we're going to free perhaps more than one, it would have to be like a positive integer return to the, to the map update uh, call. Uh, so that would at least like give us a sign of how full the map is, and then maybe if we combine how full the map is at a given point in time, and maybe over time we metric the sort of grab metrics for this over time, and maybe the, the contention going through, like the throughput, then maybe between these two things we can start to come up with some heuristics to, to do alerts and so on. Um, Maybe another idea is uh, basically get some notion of how often we're doing GC or do, doing the, the shrinking operations. So if we're shrinking the map very, very frequently, then that kind of that's an indication of the um, of the con contention on the map. Um, not to, I'm not entirely sure I understand whether there's a difference here for us is just the raw update count, um, but it's it's an idea I guess. Um, maybe one idea would be we look at we have sort of we're trying to take up to free target number of entries from the global lists. Uh, if that number is zero, then we're, it's basically highly contended and, and we're not able to get any entries at all. If it's free target, then clearly there were free target number of entries available that were not recently referenced since the last time this uh, operation occurred. So maybe that's not contended, and then maybe somewhere in between is like a sign of like contended, or maybe we have like a couple of bits and we say no contention, some contention, uh, high contention, something like that. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe we just report when we start to actually just steal an active entry from somewhere. We just say, okay, we don't care if it was least recent, well, we don't care if it was recently used. We don't strictly know if it was the most recently used, but basically just report that as a signal. I don't know. Uh, I'm not quite sure what other people's use cases and so on, uh, whether this is uh, kind of sparking ideas about how other people are using LRUs here. Um, but any of this is opinions. <laughs> but, yeah, we use LRUs, hmm? yeah, but um, let, uh, let me try to understand from the already. It's like um, yeah, the LRU map, which is uh, usually it's OK. In some situation, become too small because your active set of connection is much more than the right. can handle. So I think I think measuring this uh, statistic will be useful um, as long as it does not slow down the fast path mm -hmm. too much. Uh, some of the cases you mentioned here, especially at the one at the bottom, seems shouldn't be very often. In the normal case, you should be hit very often, right? So, so I think this, this seems to be should be okay. Um, how do we ex how do you plan to use that once you collect them? Are you going to like print that out as a statistic and then have some tools to? Yes. So in general, with with Cilium, we'll we'll emit events from the data path when we have some sort of a failure, and then we can also just count things out to a some per CPU map, and we have periodic. Uh, pulling up those statistics, um, and then those will then get pushed out to some control plane, management plane that that then um, observes those statistics and so on. Uh, and then perhaps we go out to Grafana or something like that. You could set alerts. Um, that's at least one path. Uh, uh, what if the kind of method that you have to so could we, could we insert the metadata into the map info? Okay, so basically some sort of like per map statistics that are map defined, like because this is L, specific to LRU, right? So, but then every map could have some form of metrics. If you wanted to opt in, I, I guess you would have to opt in maybe. Or you can just add that in the map data structure. You can describe it with your ETF ID and things. Using yeah, ETF just to find yeah, the ETF ID to describe it. I don't know how the, the map iterator, probably you can iterate the map or the map and then maybe imprint the map structure differently by using the ETF ID. 
then it's more like a self self described uh, statistic instead of keep extending the backing mm -hmm. for Okay, so user defines statistics based on ETF uh, information that, that you define at the map creation time, and then somehow. Somebody the hash map could hash map could have its own statistic. So we get some of that by using a entry attaching to those places, and then that's the entry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you can do integration. I don't know how many functional. How many of this function will be in neither for performance? I do want to repeat for the stream, so at least the earlier thing that Martin, uh, Martin had uh, mentioned as a concern was uh, making sure we don't affect the fast path. So towards the top of this diagram, then it's going to be happening potentially frequently. We don't want to make the fast path suffer because we're observing it. Those are trace points. If it's trace points? If it's a, if it's a, uh, I have more. Is it possible? I mean, like there's the PSI subsystem, like the pressure metrics for the kernel and everything. It's kind of hooked this up to you know, the staff path and then monitor that. I don't know enough about PSI, so I'm just putting a question. The question about using PSI for uh, matrix yeah, event. Yeah, this works, like, Doesn't seem usable. Okay. okay. Another thing you may consider is like know the you, you should just you know the the array of the map update operations. So if you know that the array of the update in the past, I don't know, thirty seconds too high for the size of the map that you can handle them, mm -hmm. and you can send a signal to your monitoring system mm -hmm. to start balancing it. It's something that we, we monitor also. Mm -hmm. For example, we track the TCP connection in the, in the LRV maps, and we track the rate of TCP sync that we have received. So just, just track the, uh, the, the rate through. Because you, you're tracking the number of Mm -hmm. The way you know the the way your your map side can handle is nice to be. So basically, just to, yeah, detecting a, a a significant change in your rate of updates to the to the maps. I haven't tried common or looking into the common or non common. Is that is that the per CPU versus non per CPU or this is different? Um, so, um, the per CPU is different. In your diagram, that's one global list, right? So, in the per CPU mode, each CPU will have its own global list so that you won't interfere, you won't contend okay, at yeah. all. So reduce contention by using the per CPU version, uh, but for connection tracking purposes, I don't know if we can guarantee that. Uh, yeah, like the global lists are also per CPU. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but the hash table is still uh, still common across. So the, yeah, the hash table is global, but the LRU property is per CPU. Yeah, so it changes the internal algorithm okay. the idea across to that one CPU is more active than another, mm -hmm. that doesn't make a thing. Okay. Because like we cannot like the logic cannot be all like the intended users, so that's why like default was picked the way it is, yeah. assuming that given distribution of laws across the view, but mm -hmm. one is active to not be exaggerated. Okay, that's a first thing into. Right. Also, also, can you try to explain with this target tree? So the target tree is it's kind of big. It's just a number, yeah, 128. Yeah. Okay. 
So just measure some impact of free targets, start to play around with those numbers. Yeah, so this was quarter of a million, but it's defined based on your memory size, basically. So it kind of it's variable, but yeah. Mm -hmm. The small ones, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I guess we should we should wrap up with the, the next speaker. But uh, my other kind of thing is, what if we do something more drastic? Because it does say in the original patch that this is mainly for kind of heavy read operations, which if you don't have a lot of new connections, that's probably true. If you have a lot of new connections, maybe that property is starting to like diverge from what the LRU is doing, or maybe there's a new LRU implementation. But I think, I, I don't know if that's, I don't have a conclusive enough idea of how that might even look. So that's more for a sort of discussion later. We can throw around ideas. But, uh, that's, that's all I have.